Uh, welcome to Second City. My name is Jez, a lead pastor here at Second City. If you're new with us, uh, great to have you with us. Uh, we look forward to diving into God's Word um, this evening. We are in our Advent series, uh, lasting three weeks, finishing um, on the 20th with a uh, carol service. We think it's most likely to be online. Um, so there's a great opportunity for us, whether we're uh, uh, here in Birmingham or we're students or we're going back or we're in different places uh, at that time over Christmas to invite some people to join us for that carol service. So uh, please be thinking about people. Um, it's a, a unique opportunity uh, each year for us where people are very, very open to hear the story of Christ's coming. They may not believe, but they're definitely interested to take part in the festivities and the story of, of Christmas. Um, so that's going to be on the 20th. So just want to remind you to, to think about who you might be inviting. Now, there's a city in southern Norway called Rekikan. And this city um, ha only has direct sunlight six months a year. And um, the rest of the time, they're in darkness, they're in a valley. And so when the sun is low, it can't get over, over the hill. And um, Martin Anderson, who's an artist who lives there, says this. He says, more than other, any other place that I've lived, they, they talk about the sun a lot. When it's coming out, how long it's been out, um, when they last saw the sun. He said they're, they're a little bit obsessed with it. Uh, and he says, last, he said, to start with, they, they were trying to work out how they could get sun in their life because they realized that they were getting more depressed. And there were other things like an increase in suicide in the, in the six months when it was dark. And so first of all, they put a, a um, oh, what do you call it? Sorry, a stair lift that would take them up to the top of the mountain. And at the top of the mountain, they could go up one by one and, and sit in the sun. And then they decided that they would put these um, mirrors, these reflective mirrors on them so that when the sun was low, they could set them and move them so that the sun could come down and hit. And they set it specifically so they could go uh, right into the center of their town. There you are, you can see it there, right into the center of the town, right into the, ta into the, into the square. And when it comes out, uh, the sun comes out in, in the winter season and it hits the mirror and it goes down there, they all get together and they start to sort of sunbathe and have a party. Look, you can see them there celebrating uh, the sun. And uh, they have this interesting and complex relationship with the sun. They realize that they, they need the sun. And it isn't just the physical sun that people need in our world, is it? Let's be honest. There is a darkness, a shadow that casts over our world that is more emotional, more relational, ultimately spiritual, I would say, a spiritual darkness that covers us. It's often unexplained and undiagnosed, um, but people have this inner experience that they often feel that something is missing, something's not there, something's not quite right. And we try to fill the void with all sorts of different things. Sometimes it's material things, sometimes even religious things and or relationships. But the, but the reality is there is a kind of darkness that covers our society and is in our world and is subtle and underneath things. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you're experiencing that now, that something's not quite right with our world. Um, the creative arts have a wonderful way of sort of telling a story or expressing something about the reality of this. And, and so many um, songs that are written or, or films that are made or poems that are, that, are, that are spoken talk about this dilemma, this, 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 un, this reality that's hard to describe, but we kind of know it's there for ourselves. I was recently watching a film called, uh, what was it called? A Star Was Born. And it's a, a remake, actually, of a 1934 film. I think it's been made, remade three other times. And this is the latest one um, uh, starring Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. And surprisingly, Lady Gaga uh, is excellent in it. Um, and it's a, it's a film about an a, a artist who's um, struggling. Um, her name's Ali in the film. And she meets somebody called Jackson Maine, who's... Um, a successful artist, but in his personal life, he's a complete mess. And it sort of charts their, their relationship. She's going up and he's coming down. And it, and it sort of 
tells a story of this uh, Jackson Maine's um, battle with the inner demons in his life from the past. And it's, it's terribly sad. It's terribly uh, um, harrowing, I'll be honest. Uh, I haven't watched a film like this in, in a long time, which left me just feeling totally bereft and feeling, oh, Lord, people feel like this. Now, because I love Jesus, because I know Jesus, I don't feel the same way. Yeah, I have moments of doubt, moments of, 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 of internal battle with myself. But because I know Jesus and I know the hope that he brings, then this reality isn't mine. But, but this is so much the reality that people experience. And weaved into the film of uh, some of Lady Gaga's uh, music, and there's a particular song that came out of this film that is fairly famous called Shallow. And it talks just about that experience of emptiness. So we're just going to listen to it a little bit now. Uh, I just want you to, to read the words and to, to just reflect on what she's saying. What she's saying about how people feel um, and their purpose in life and their wrestle with meaning. words of that song are powerful, aren't they? What does it say? In the good times, I find myself longing for change. So even in the good times, I want things to change. And in the bad times, I fear myself. How true is that in our society today? How true is that in, in the lives maybe of our friends or family who don't know Jesus? And it's, it's a desperate Reality is in the darkness, is palpable in our world. And we don't like to talk about it and we don't like to admit it. And we try to cover it up in all sorts of ways. We want to say that our, our society is progressing and, and we're growing and we're getting better and we're getting more caring. But actually more people are more lonely, more depressed, more upset with more fear, more anxiety, more disappointment, more rejection, more sadness than ever before. And when I watched that film, when I listened to that song, I just wanted to cry out to the Lord, Lord, how long, how long must this go on for? How much, much? How long must we live in this world? How long must people suffer in this way, O oh Lord? Of course, we might say, well, yeah, it's, it's their suffering. They choose to live that way. But, it, but it's more than that, isn't it? It's the world that we're born into. Every single one of us is wrestling with a broken relationship with our Heavenly Father, a broken relationship with ourselves, a broken relationship with, with, with each other, a broken relationship with our creation. And we see this pouring out in so many different ways, in abuse, in oppression, in isms, as many as you can put in front of them. People being hurt, people being broken, people suffering mental health issues. Lord, how long before your light will break through in this nation, our nation, our city? We know Christ has come. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But how long, Lord, will it be? before you break in to this city? Will you renew this country again? Maybe you might even be able to put how long and put a name there. You've got somebody that you've been praying for, somebody that you've been longing to be set free from the darkness, to be set free from the inner turmoil. Well, when we come to, when we come to Isaiah here, um, the context is just very, very similar for the people of Israel. In the end of chapter eight, Verse 21, it says this, they will pass through the land, great distress and hunger. And they will, and when they are hungry, they will be enraged and they will seek contentiously against their king and against their God. And they will turn their face upward and they will look to the earth. Behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. And they will be thrust into thick darkness. Isaiah is describing here the nation of Israel who've descended into a thick darkness. Why? Because they've rejected God. They've, they've started to look in other directions for help, whether it be political or spiritual or even just inside themselves for answers to the questions of life. But it's in the midst of this gloom that a light starts to shine. It's in the midst of this difficult season for the nation of Israel that God speaks a word of hope into their life. And it's a word of hope that says, he is coming. He is coming. First one says this, but, but, relating back to the, to the darkness, but 
There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former times, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the nations. In the midst of this gloom, Jesus uh, uh, is coming. A light is coming, we're going to find out. And that light is a new king and a new kingdom. Interestingly here, the, um, uh, the, the prophecy comes to the land of Zebulun and to the land of Natalie. Why, why is that? Because they're the pe people who first experienced the darkness in the northern kingdom in Galilee. And that's where the king of Assyria came in um, to attack them. And they were the first to come under darkness. So what Jesus is saying, uh, what God, God, uh, the prophet is saying here is, the reverse is going to be happening. You are going to be the first ones to receive the light. They're going to be the first ones to experience this being set free from captivity. They're going to be the first to see Emmanuel in the flesh. And that's true, isn't it? Jesus started his ministry amongst the Gentiles. And it was them that first saw uh, the Messiah coming. And so the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. Matthew himself quotes verses one and two in his gospel as he speaks of Jesus coming and residing in Capernaum. And so we know that, that what Isaiah is talking about is the coming of the Messiah. But who's coming? Who is it that's coming to save them? Well, verse three tells us, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's a child who would be king. Notice here, in just in this section here, how the prophet expresses the humanity of the Messiah. A child is to be born to us. He has to become a human being. He's going to be born as a child. And yes, he would endure temptation. and He would uh, endure suffering. Yet without sin, we're told in Hebrews. And he would become our substitute. You see, a man had to die for man's sin. And nothing less would do. So as Isaiah prophesied, he said, a child is coming, one who is going to be human. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and to us, a son is given. And the, the son here is his idea, idea of deity, that, that it's going to be the son, the second person of the Trinity, who's going to be born in human flesh. Uh, um, Philippians talks about this in, ver in chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. He says, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and, making, and being made in the likeness of man. The Son of God came in human form and wrapped himself in flesh. Why? To conquer sin. You see, it had to be a perfect man to die a death for humans that weren't perfect. Because if he had sinned, he could only die for his own death. And who is perfect except for the Lord? And so these two things, God's human, uh, 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 Jesus' humanity and his deity come together in the person of Jesus. A new hope is born, a new way to deal with the darkness, and a new way. Um, to, 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 to bring a new kingdom, to get rid of sin and death and its consequence in the world. A light has shone. A light has come into the world. And his name is Jesus. Notice also about his rulership. It says, the government will rest on his shoulders. It affirms the lordship of Jesus. The lordship of of this Messiah. It looks forward to the time when Christ will rule literally over the heavens and the earth, that 
every government, the whole of the government of, of the world order will rest on his shoulder. And then we have these beautiful names just describing something of the character, something of the reputation of the one who is his to come. He's going to be a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. That's what his reputation is going to be because that is what he's going to do. And so this is good news. This is great news that there is a hope for humanity. There is a hope for us. What sort of kingdom is he going to be? Why, why would you want to be part of this kingdom? Well, verses three onwards to seven talks about um, the type of kingdom that Jesus is going to bring. I'm just going to spend a few moments talking about how, how wonderful this kingdom is. And the first thing we see is this is a kingdom of great light and not darkness. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of, the, of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. Here is some poetic language. Darkness signifies adversity, dis, uh, despair, uh, gloom and evil. And light signifies prosperity and peace and joy. And we see the, uh, this language used elsewhere. Uh, Malachi uses it. He says, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And so this is hope that this light of joy and peace and hope is going to shine in the darkness, uh, a place of despair and disappointment and gloom. Notice also these words are in the past tense. It's as if, the, the prophet Isaiah is looking into the future. He has seen it happen. He's saying the light has shone. He's seen it happen. He's describing it to the people, saying it is a fact. It, it will happen. The light will shine the dawn. I've seen it. One is coming who's going to help uh, bring all of humanity out of his darkness, out of their darkness. And what does the light do? The light reveals the universal problem of sin in humanity that is often hidden from us, of which we try to avoid, we try not to name. It reveals sin in its most ugliest form. But also, it brings hope. It reveals, in this, in this scenario, it reveals the very person of God that Jesus came and he was the light, and he revealed what it was like to, have, to, 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 to be human and to have a relationship with your Heavenly Father. He revealed what it was like, what God was like in, in human flesh. His ways, his works, his words revealed in plain sight. There's no more guessing about who God is and what he, he does. We see healing and forgiveness and love and generosity, and kindness in the person of Jesus. The light has shone. And Jesus shines not only into our lives in a personal way, he also shines into human society. Jesus shines a light on injustice in our world with hope. Jesus shines a light in the darkness, in our brokenness, and he brings hope. Jesus shines a light in the darkness on our oppression in our world, and he brings hope. Jesus shines a light on the greed in our world, and he brings a new hope. Tim Keller says this, the coming of Jesus brings the possibility of personal transformation. We can be changed. We can be lifted out of the darkness and despair of our lives and into a new kingdom of light. There is a progressive nature to this change. But he goes on to say, the coming of Jesus brings into the possibility of community transformation. Our city can be changed. There's a circular nature to this change. We're changed, therefore our city is changed. Our city is changed, therefore we are changed. Both are realities of Jesus coming into our world. So the first thing we see is, is a great kingdom of light and not darkness. Second thing we see that Jesus came to bring was a kingdom of extravagant joy and not despair. 
You see, the prophet here turns now directly to address, address the Lord. And his words explain what it means for the light to, be disp to dispel the darkness. Joy and prosperity will follow. He says this, you have, the multitude, you have multitude the nations. You have increased its joy. With the, with, they rejoice before you as, as joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoils. Now, the prophet gives no idea where, when this will happen, but only that this will happen, that when he comes, there will be an increase of joy. And then he uses two analogies to describe that, a harvest analogy and then a battle analogy that he uses. And he says, look, both blessing in the harvest and battle, both will lead to joy. He says this, uh, you know, in terms of the harvest, they describe here how this harvest um, produces joy. And of course, you know, this is a, a, rural, society, a rural society or a society that um, depends on its wealth through, uh, through the land. So harvest was a great, was a regular time of joy in, in Israel. And they would, ha they would labor and labor and then they were gathering all the harvest and then they would celebrate, eat and drink. And it's part of the festivals that Israel's would have. But what he's saying here is that there will be a harvest um, with, as it were, with great joy, that when Jesus comes, it's going to be like a harvest, but even better than the normal type of harvest. He's going to bring something that is so satisfying that lasts for, for us. There's going to be thanksgiving when Jesus comes. The second thing we see here is this, this idea of being in a battle and sharing the spoils. Um, as they are glad when they divide the spoils. So the second imagery here is of dividing the, the spoils. It's a bit more poignant since wars would lead, you know, the, the, the wars, um, we've, we've experienced wars um, throughout the ages. And the idea is here, there's a victory. There's a victory that leads to sharing the spoils. And that when Jesus comes, he's going to give a victory, a decisive victory, which will lead to a great celebration, a sharing of the spoils of his victory, and we will share in those spoils. And we, we see that part of that, the spoils, is joy, peace, kindness, patience, et cetera, et cetera. There's a tangible personal reality for us. And so there's a picture here of this joy in the kingdom that is irrepressible and uncontainable that both famine or war can, cannot contain it. That, there's a, that the battle between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light will be won, it will be set, settled. Or, to say it in the words, uh, in, in the context of the, of the future, as Isaiah is, is speaking, it has been won. It will be won. It's as good as won. Now, of course, we stand this side of Jesus coming and dying on the cross, and we are absolutely certain that the kingdom of light has beaten the kingdom of darkness. That it's put to death um, sin, that we have no longer anything to fear. And so we have great rejoicing and celebration and not despair. The third part of the kingdom is, is this, that it's going to be a kingdom of lasting peace and not war. Listen to these words from verses four and five. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in the battle torment and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. So here, the prophet Isaiah foresees a time when the Lord will, will break the oppression of his enemies. That there will be again this decisive victory and he will bring peace. And he says... To, to the people of Israel, do you remember the battle of Midian? Do you remember how we won the battle um, um, at the time of Gideon? How the Lord did this, how it was the Lord's power that brought this decisive victory. Well, it's going to be the same. The Lord is going to bring a victory, just like in Midian through Gideon, where, where he got rid of all those people and just left them with 300 so that the people would know that it was God himself who'd won the victory. Well, he says, we're going to win... That it's going to be the same victory that we're going to have that's going to bring peace. And they're here, there's a picture 
of the oppressor being broken, but then also just the, the, the victory being a place where it's like the war to end all wars. Every garment rolled in blood, every boot that's trampled in, in the warrior, they're all going to be put together, they're going to be burned on the fire because it's going to be needed no more. This victory will ultimately end all the wars. In chapter two, Isaiah says something similar about the end of these wars. He says, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. There'll be no need for military weapons. Why? Because there's going to come a time of lasting peace. And who doesn't need lasting peace don't we all need a lasting peace don't we all long for a lasting peace are you fed up with repeating repeatedly being negative about yourself your battle with humility and pride not being happy with who you are or what you have are you fed up with working so hard that it's never ending and having this burdensome expectation no matter what you do it feels like it's never enough There's not enough time for you to be with your family. There's not enough time for you to do the work that needs to be done. Are you fed up also at sinning against God? And the shame that just keeps on creeping into your head, that keeps on reminding you of the past. The words that you said or you didn't say or the actions that you did or you shouldn't have done um, or could have done. Or are you fed up? of your heart not being pure and good all the time. You fight, or you fight with being sacrificial in your service and not having a desire for your service to meet yourself. Are you, are you fed up with being uh, double-hearted? Don't you long to desire to, to change? There's a battle that's going on inside of us. And what the prophet Isaiah is saying that is that Jesus is going to come and bring a decisive victory in the battle against sin, both in our relationship to God, in our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with other people. We need this lasting peace and Christ has secured it for us. And Isaiah is predicting a day when it's going to come to be. And then finally, it's a kingdom forever and not temporarily. It's a kingdom forever. Look, listen to this. Of the increase of his, his governance, government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it <clears throat> and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from, thi- from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Isaiah ends with this idea that there's going to come a time where this Messiah, this child who has come to be king, is going to rule forever. And when he starts to rule, it will never end. Now, we know that we're in a time where his governance is there, but it's not fully materialized in the sense of over the earth. It's going to come when he comes again. But even now, his government is developing he has, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, just could take a bit of water. Jesus is ruling now as king. And there's going to come a time where all his enemies are going to be under his feet. Not one of them will stand against him. But for now, he leaves a time for people to recognize his kingship, to recognize his true leadership, to come under his power, to come under his sway. To put put our trust in the one who is God, the one who came to this earth and took on flesh, the one who died on the cross to to, to, to take our sins and pay for them, the one who um, had a victory over that death and rose again so that we might too have victory over death and we might too have victory over, uh, we, we may too be resurrected into our bodies. And so... How will this be accomplished? The zeal of the Lord. Now, I just want you to think about that for a moment. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What does that mean? It means because of the love of God that he had for his people, because of his broken heart towards 
the situation that, that humanity finds themselves in. Because he longed for, his, for, for a people for himself and for them to be free from sin and death and shame and guilt, God did this. God did it all. We had no part to play in it. All this was accomplished because the Lord had a zeal to do it. He wanted to do it. He desired to do it. He loved to do it. We're in a world that needs desperately to know that there is hope, to know that there is a light in this darkness. It doesn't matter how much you've got or how little you've got. It doesn't matter whether your circumstances are good or your circumstances are bad. Deep down, we know there's a void. We know there's, a, there's something empty in our lives if we don't know Jesus. And your friends, your family, your work colleagues, your neighbors, they, they struggle to express it. They don't know how to express it. They wrestle with it. Some, re, some do reject it, but many don't know how to, 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 to deal with it. Many don't know the hope that we, we have. And so in this season, let me just encourage you. Let us speak about the Lord of hosts. Let's talk, let's talk about the one who is the wonderful counselor, who is the Prince of Peace, who's the everlasting father, who has come to this earth to bring a new king and to bring a new kingdom, a kingdom of light, a kingdom of joy, a kingdom of peace, a forever kingdom. And this is the hope that many of us have and we're reveling. And I pray that this evening, that you will just be encouraged to know that you are part of God's forever kingdom. I also pray that your hearts will break. Your heart will break for those around us who do not have the hope that we have. Pray that God will use you in this season to speak about the light, to speak about the one who has come, to speak about Emmanuel, God with us. People are open to listen. People want to hear in this season. They want to know why we are celebrating Christmas. Well, it's because Christ came and dwelt among us and he brought hope. He brought peace. He brought joy. He brought an everlasting kingdom that we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we will be with him forever. Let me just pray for us and then we can break off into our groups for some discussion. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you have done in sending your son. Thank you that you, that you saw a way to bring us back to you. And what a wonderful kingdom it is um, that you have set up for us. Kingdom of peace, a kingdom of light, kingdom of hope, kingdom of joy, an everlasting kingdom. And we have the privilege to be part of it. And because of that, all despair, all disappointment can be overcome. Even, even though we have to wrestle with it, even we have to battle with it. We know a peace because of the Holy Spirit in us. We know a peace because we know the truth and he lives in us. We know a peace or a partial peace with ourselves and we're continuing to grow in that peace. But there are others, Father, who don't know your peace and they're living in darkness and we pray, Father, have mercy. Use us, we pray, to speak the truth about who Christ is and what he's done, that they may be rescued from their darkness and their feet might be set on the solid rock who is Jesus. We know that we cannot do it in our own strength, just in the same way that the increase of the government and peace and the establishment of the kingdom that will know no end is done through the zeal of the Lord. We know that in the same way, the task that you have sent us on to speak to others about, about, about you will be done because of your zeal. I pray that you would give us your zeal, your passion for those who don't know you, those who are broken, those who need forgiveness, those who are trapped in shame and guilt. Give us a heart for them. Break our hearts, we pray, just as your heart is and was broken for them. And Father, show us how we can serve you in this time. For we ask this in your name. Amen.